how do you balance those out? The optimism and the eco-anxiety? I think it's definitely not an easy path. I'm Eleanor. I'm a third year physicist at Merton College and co-president of the School of Climate Change with Oxford Climate Society. It's lovely to meet you. It's lovely to meet you, Eleanor. I'm Lavanya Rajami. I'm a professor of international environment law at the law faculty. I work on international climate change law and policy, so I guess that's where our interests overlap. Very exciting to talk to you today, so thank you. What was your journey into the climate space and what made climate law an interesting area for you? What sparked my interest was the overlap between climate uh, impacts and justice issues, both in terms of who was actually creating the problem and who was bearing the brunt of it, but also, uh, also in terms of who was responsible for it and who was now being asked to sort of uh, be part of the solution. So both the developing developed country dynamic, but also the vulnerable and major emitter dynamic. What are your like personal thoughts on responsibility and where does that lie? So I think uh, the starting point is for each one of us to take some ownership of this problem and its solutions, right? So I think I would start even at the individual level. But then beyond that, we need institutions to be accountable, we need governments to be accountable and to take ownership of this problem. And I think at that level, um, we have seen a real failure of accountability. And I think part of what, as international lawyers, we're trying to do is to push the, the international community and, and every level of governance below it to take some responsibility and ownership of the problem. Maybe narrowing down on this responsibility or accountability, because these are both quite kind of abstract terms. Mm -hmm. In the legal sphere, what does that really look like, holding states or actors accountable? So the International Court of Justice um, sort of you know, produced a remarkable advisory opinion this summer. It held that states have a very uh, objective, stringent, demanding standard of due diligence that is attached to what they do. And if the, that standard of due diligence is breached, there can be responsibility that flows from it. Um, and responsibility in that legal context means there are consequences for breaching, legal consequences for breaching those obligations that fall on states. So yes, there is a possibility that this could happen. There's a lot that needs to be done to concretize this, but it is a possibility legally to hold major emitters to account for their uh, excessive greenhouse gas emissions. What are the bounds that legal accountability can really look like? You were saying that it needs a lot of advancements to get there, right. but I guess just pushing you on this issue a little bit more. So I guess one of the challenges that's always posed to international law is that it doesn't really have the capacity to enforce legal norms or judgments that emerge or at least from that international it's a challenge to Yeah. It is uh, it is true that for the most part international law works. It's only it's only the cases of egregious non-compliance, you know, that we see, including in situations of war and conflict around the world. Those cases of egregious non-compliance are the ones that come to the fore, but for the most part, international law does work because states actually feel some ownership of the norms that emerge from sort of from the negotiations that create and the uh, consensus-based and consent-based sort of international law evolutionary process. So I'm, I'm sort of curious about your journey as well, what drives you, what mot motivates you, and, you know, how you're here. It's such a persistent issue. It's unavoidable and I feel this very like intense sense of ownership or responsibility for taking care of what I can, doing what I can within my capabilities. So I'm really excited to be at the moment studying in a di discipline that will take me to interesting areas where I can make a real difference in the climate space and hopefully you know drive as much impact as you have throughout your career. So what kind of impact do, do you and your peers hope to have in this space with the kinds of things that you're doing, both academically, but also you know, with your work at the Oxford Climate Society? We run the School of Climate Change, which is a course that anyone from the university or around Oxford can participate in. Mm -hmm. And you see the dedication, the optimism, the intellectual interest that so many students have in these issues. If the question was directed more to where that drive comes from, mm -hmm. I think it generally comes from 
a sensitivity to climate that has become more mainstream um, over the past couple years. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been hugely uh, sort of reinforcing to actually see so many young people enter into this space. So do you find that people also connecting in your peer group or connecting the personal and the political in that way, taking ownership of the problem as well? Yeah, it's an interesting point to make. A lot of people are taking personal responsibility for these worldly changes and making personal lifestyle choices. But I think there's also a strong sentiment that the problem is not from their originality and that there needs to be systemic change well, as well. Yeah. That disenfranchisement seems like a strong word to put to the feeling, but certainly a sentiment that it's not us on our own. Mm -hmm. Collective action, the systemic change that we need comes from being with other people, supporting each other and forming a group where we can therefore as one larger number you know, lobby for stronger change. No, absolutely. You know, we do need systemic change because there's a limit to what we can do with just taking personal responsibility and lifestyle changes. I'm, I'm sort of really inspired to think that your generation still sees a lot of hope and optimism for the future in this context. So do you feel that there are sort of moments of eco-anxiety that, you know, that you and your peers suffer from, or do you still have cause for optimism? How do you balance those out, the optimism and the eco-anxiety? I think it's definitely not an easy path. The doom and gloom in the media, or um, not reaching certain climate targets, or government policy having to be changed and like less investment in climate projects can contribute to that sense of hopelessness. Mm. But I think that there's also a lot of optimism that we have a lot of the technologies and the solutions to solve a lot of the major climate change problems. It's simply about the implementation of them. And so that's why, as a young person, I remain optimistic around my contribution to climate that it's not a hopeless cause in that we have a lot of the tools to solve a lot of the problems. It simply needs dedicated people to go and use those tools. And so that's what gives me optimism that I can be that person to go use those tools. So that sort of gives me a lot of faith <laughs> that, uh, in, in the planet's future and our collective future. So thank you, uh, Elna, for sharing that. Uh, thank you as well. It was really amazing to hear from you and for you to share your insights as well with me. So thank you as well. Thank you.